Thinking Aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeff Mishlove. This is part two of our two-part series on training remote viewing with Dr. Paul Smith, who is a founder and past president of the International Remote Viewing Association. Paul participated in the military remote viewing program for seven years. He's a former Army intelligence officer as well as a philosopher and is the author of Reading the Enemy's Mind and the Essential Guide to Remote Viewing. Welcome again, Paul. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. In the first uh, part of our two-part series, we talked about uh, a lot of things, but essentially we covered stages one and stage two of uh, the remote viewing training process. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a six-stage program that you went through over a period of many years. Uh, I'm under the impression that these days the training has become accelerated. It doesn't need to take many years the way it once did. Right. Uh, in fact, it probably didn't need to take many years back then. Mm -hmm. Many as in, well, actually many months is probably a better term. Um, of the six-stage process, it took us a, a full year to get through the first three with mm -hmm. Ingo Swan. Um, that, there was a number of reasons for that. One was that we just had a lot of administrative military administrative issues going on. There was some question about the survival of the program. We had a lot of dealings with general officers and stuff we had to worry about. And so we had gaps in our training. Mm -hmm. But the other process, uh, part of it, was that Inco had this uh, philosophy, legitimate it turns out, that uh, you needed to have spaced learning. Mm -hmm. You needed to you know, have an intense learning experience and then back off and do something else for a while. Give yourself time to digest. Exactly absorb, assimilate everything. Exactly. In fact, those were the terms he used. Assimilate mm -hmm. was a big one for him. You were assimilating what you were, what you were uh, learning, experiencing. Um, the only thing is that this was very early in the process, and so he didn't know how long that absorption process had to last. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't unusual for you, for you to go in to do some training, do a session in the morning, do really well on that session, and Ingo will tell you not to come back for the rest of the day, because mm -hmm. you are going to assimilate that, that experience. And he also wanted you to leave feeling confident yes. and successful. Yes. Qu quit on a high was another of his mantras, mm -hmm. essentially. You quit on a high. You could, you could fail 15 times, but as soon as you got that one hit, then he wanted you to stop there. And, and, it, and it, he, I think he got this idea from sports training, which was exploring the same idea at the time. Um, it turns out to be very legitimate. In mm -hmm. fact, his idea of space learning um, really just in the last maybe decade has become very popular in, in foreign language training and some of these other, and, and music training as well. Uh, where you, instead of spend hours and hours and hours doing this rote process over and over again, mm -hmm. you spend uh, a short amount of time working on whatever skill it is, relatively short amount of time, say I'd say yeah. 15 minutes or whatever, or 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then you go away and do something else, and then you come back and do another 15 or 20 minutes, and you go away and do something else. Uh, it's been shown that you retain what you've learned of that skill significantly better if you do this space learning than if you have done the old rote, rote you know, mm -hmm. bludgeon, uh, blunt instrument kind of approach to well, it. Well, is it your belief that remote viewing is a skill akin to language or music that uh, can be trained in much the same way? It's absolutely the same mm -hmm. in, in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, I know not everybody thinks so. Yes, there are, there are people who argue that, that this is just something you can do or you can't. Mm -hmm. But like language, we all have the innate ability to speak a language, but when we're born, we don't. We have to learn to speak whatever our native tongue is, but we can only learn to do that because we already have the ability born into us. Mm -hmm. um, they say when you're training animals to do tricks, right, that you can't train an animal to do a trick that doesn't have some antecedent in its normal behavioral patterns. Mm -hmm. The same thing is true with this. Um, the SRI research, Stanford Research Institute research, showed 
that there's a very widespread ability in the population, probably universal, mm -hmm. or, or as close to universal as you can mm -hmm. get. Um, because we're talking about the nature of human consciousness, mm -hmm. ultimately. And all humans have consciousness yeah. of some kind, right? right. So, exactly. And, um, but the, pro the thing is that you have the raw material, you don't necessarily then have the skill to take advantage of that raw material. Sure. And so that's what remote viewing is, uh, what we're doing with remote viewing training. Mm -hmm. Now, the kind of training that we're talking about here, the six stage process, is, is formally known as controlled remote viewing. Yes. Um, there's other varieties, and I talk about generic remote viewing for want of a better term, because mm -hmm. no other term has been coined for it. And that's the folks who just kind of learn it trial and error. They just sort of learn it on their own. Mm -hmm. And you can learn remote viewing that way. I mean, the early remote viewers, that's how they learned it. Yeah. But this is more of a codified, mm -hmm. structured approach that that seems to help people learn it more quickly and more consistently mm -hmm. than just the old trial and error kind of a thing. Well, you sometimes hear the phrase military grade remote viewing as, as if it implies, uh, well, something very serious in terms of its purpose and, and the desired results. Yes. And we, we like to joke military grade, you know, was, was provided by the lowest bidder, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's also mil spec, you know, military specifications, and in mm -hmm. some degree that does convey quality because when you talk about, for example, mil spec weapons, mm -hmm. they've got to function. Yeah. They absolutely have to function. And so, um, to some degree, military grade um, can indicate you have that there's an advantage there, that mm -hmm. there's something valuable. Uh, and of course, the blessing of all of this, uh, the way the program ended and all that, is that now the whole civilian world can have access to that military grade mm -hmm. approach to consciousness, mm -hmm. applied consciousness, yes. essentially. Well, and that's what you do. You, mm -hmm. you train that uh, based on the training you've been through. I, it might be worth mentioning right now uh, how, how you would distinguish between a remote viewer and a psychic. Yeah, that's a little bit of a, it's almost like trying to tell where red and purple are differentiated on the, on the color spectrum, right? Uh -huh. It just sort of becomes red or sort of becomes purple and there's no clear distinction. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, <coughs> I guess you could say a remote viewer is someone who has an actual uh, studied technique and the core of the technique is distinguishing mental noise from the signal. Mm -hmm. That really is kind of the, the, the foundational element of the remote viewing process that that uh, Ingo Swan and Hal Putoff developed, and it's fairly typical of even the whole remote viewing program at, at uh, SRI, um, is that the recognition that there is this issue of mental noise. Mm -hmm. um, most, I, I don't use this term pejoratively, but most garden, garden variety psychics, people who just yeah. spontaneously start being psychic or, mm -hmm. or have their own little uh, approach to how to learn that, mm -hmm. uh, most of those folks particularly earlier before remote viewing came on the scene, didn't really recognize the distinction between mental noise and and signal. Yeah. And so you, you that's why you often find uh, psychics being relatively unreliable. Sometimes they do a really dynamite job, and other times they'd be completely out of the ballpark, mm -hmm. and, and they themselves probably didn't really know why or how that happened. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm seeing generalities here. Obviously, there's exceptions to this. Remote viewers have some of the same issues. They do, but at least they recognize that uh, that that this mental noise thing is the mm -hmm. contributor, and yeah. we understand somewhat the cause of it, and we also understand somewhat how you can deal with it. Mm -hmm. Now, now not all remote viewers learn it properly, and so you know some of these remote viewers will learn it through uh, osmosis, if you will, or whatever you yeah. know, learn whatever it means, and mm -hmm. don't have a formal approach to it. And they sort of vaguely have this idea of mental noise, but they really don't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And so you'll find them having many of the same issues as a, as a standard psychic might. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I want to add here that there are psychics who actually figure this out. Yeah. And those folks are actually, can be very good. Mm -hmm. Now I would have distinguished between a remote viewer and a psychic mm -hmm. this way. I would say remote viewers are always looking at physical targets uh -huh. that can be verified. Yes. In principle can be verified, whereas many psychics are looking at non-physical 
things and mm -hmm. reporting where there's no opportunity for clear verification mm -hmm. if it's past lives, spirit guides, mm -hmm. the nature of your aura, yes. uh, things of that sort. Uh, those are all metaphysical entities. And that, that can be a distinction, but I would mm -hmm. say that's only between some psychics mm -hmm. and remote viewers because yeah. there are some psychics who are very much more grounded. And, and yeah, there are some who yeah. specialize in law enforcement yes, work. Yes, exactly. And, and there are remote viewers who, who, who do who the get, same. Get into esoterics. There are remote viewers who get into esoterics. Uh, yeah. One very popular thing early on, uh, partly due to who that some of the people who introduced remote viewing to the public, they were also interested in UFOs. And yeah. so they want to use remote viewing to explore UFOs. I like to joke that you're using one mystery to explore another. It's not <laughs> a joke. I think it's one of the tragedies. And yeah. many of our viewers are probably thinking right now, well, if the program was so successful, why did the military drop it, assuming mm -hmm. that they have? I assume they have. Do you? Yes, pretty much. I say mm -hmm. there's 90% chance that the military is not doing it. Yeah. Uh, 10% chance that they might be, mm -hmm. right? Or, or not just military, but the intelligence. Yeah, my best right? guess, and I could be wrong, you probably know much better than I, is that the effort to use one mystery to solve another, as, yeah. you, as you put it, uh, was the death knell of the program. Well, no, there were actually other reasons, because that really didn't become very prominent until after it emerged into the civilian world. Uh -huh. But you can see the undeniable attraction of one who uses this to try and resolve some of these other mysteries, like xenobiology, uh, I guess it's cryptozoology is mm -hmm. what they call it, right? Cryptozoology, yeah. and UFOs, that kind of thing, is because other means aren't satisfactory or not producing mm -hmm. satisfactory results. Right. Well, let's use this that seems to be unhampered by the same limitations of other mm -hmm. information developing means. Yeah. The problem is that th that we get into then the psychic realm, right? Because yeah. then you're going against uh, targets, uh, you know, missions, assignments, whatever, that you can't verify. Mm -hmm. You can develop this information, but because a certain percentage of remote viewings, no matter what, have a bit of fantasy in them, mm -hmm. you can't know whether this result you've come up with is fantasy or whether it's real, because mm -hmm. you can't verify it. I tend to state, I call these esoteric targets or anomaly targets, okay. I kind of use those inter interchangeably, mm -hmm. and I, I recommend matter that other people stay away from it, and I myself try and stay away, away from them. Although I haven't been completely successful because a remote viewer has to be blind to the target. Yeah. If you have a task with that's absolutely determined to get you to do a UFO target, you may end up doing one even without wanting to. So Typically these days, I gather, instead of giving you uh, map coordinates, you might be just given a number and yes. say, this is target number 1735. Describe yes. it. You do something along those lines. I, I like to... Uh, to use the example of 8675, uh, how's it go? 8675309, uh, you know, which is actually the name of the song title. Yes, I recall yes, that song. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But essentially, we have a number we attach to the intent of the target, which is or the intent of the tasking. So, for example, if the uh, if it, let's say it's a training session and the Eiffel Tower, the the tasker the treat teacher wants you to remote view the Eiffel Tower. They're not mm -hmm. going to tell you to remote view the Eiffel Tower because right. you get all that mental noise, right? Mm -hmm. So they'll give you 8675309, and uh, that they have independently attached to the intent mm -hmm. to describe the Eiffel Tower. There's an envelope somewhere with that number on uh -huh. it, and inside the sealed envelope is... Uh, a picture of the Eiffel Tower or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I like to say a remote viewer has to be psychic in two different ways, right? The first one is the obvious one. They have to actually develop information about the target to which they have no sensory or technical connection, mm -hmm. right? Um, the other way is they have to find out what the target is in the first place. So, you know, there's speculation here, but maybe there's an element of telepathy there, that mm -hmm. they're picking up from the task or what it is that they're supposed to do. Or, well, or well, some remote viewing deliberately puts an uh, element of telepathy into it. If you have an outbound experimenter mm -hmm. who's there at the target during the experiment. There's a potential for telepathy, but the way an outbounder experiment is designed, its goal is to avoid telepathy and focus on the clairvoyant aspect of the remote viewing. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, well, well, exactly, we also call them not just outbounder, but beacon experiments as an alternative beacon, name. Beacon, yes. What you're doing is using that person to pinpoint the target, and then what you're doing is you're homing in on the person with your, con with your mm -hmm. uh, conscious perception, and then you're using that just as a, as a way of accessing it consciously, and then you explore the target. Mm -hmm. And there's reasons to believe that that's what was going on, because uh, oftentimes remote viewers would report on things that the people at the target had no awareness of and could not have had awareness oh. of. 
And so, at, at the very least, if there was telepathy going on, that part couldn't have been telepathy. Right. Okay. Well, and there's no way to rule out various uh, psychic gifts that might be contributing. It could be precognition, retrocognition, mm -hmm. telepathy, clairvoyance, mm -hmm. uh, out-of-body experience. Mm -hmm. All of those things might be part of the process yeah. for all we know. Which is actually why a lot of folks now kind of try and avoid all of that talk. And yeah. You get uh, Ed May who will talk about uh, Let's see, anomalous cognition. Ed, right. Ed May being another researcher, researcher who yes. was involved at SRI and later on at uh, another research institute that actively you receive government funding for remote mm -hmm. viewing. You get other folks like Russell Targ, who is one of the SRI researchers, mm -hmm. and uh, Steve, well, uh, Stephen Schwartz, yes. who is uh, kind of an independent researcher. Mm -hmm. uh, both of them like to use the term non local perception. Yes. And um, at least you're not committing yourself to something that you can't actually know for sure which way it goes by doing that. It's kind of like mm -hmm. the, the term psi itself, the PSI, you know. Well, I think, uh, sure, P scientists want yeah. to r be free from theoretical baggage. And yeah. I think also from some of the controversies that yes. surround older words, psychic, clairvoyance, uh, pe people already form mental pictures that are not always positive. And, th and, that's, and even if they were positive, they may not be right. Mm -hmm. So that's always an issue. You always have baggage with yeah. terminology. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about stage three. Yes. So once you've had the sensory connection that you get in stage two, you describe the target in sensory terms, you start kind of getting a feel for the dimensionality of the target, how it is in physical space. Is it tall? Is it wide? Is it dense? Is it hollow? Those kinds of ideas. And then when you merge into stage three, you actually start making sketches of the target. Mm -hmm. So here's where this kinesthetic sense, in a way, comes in, because I like to talk about sketching as your right brain bypassing your left brain, which does all of this analysis and interpretation, yeah. and talking directly to your hand. Mm -hmm. Because in a way, you've heard about heard of auto, uh, automatic writing. Yes. In remote viewing, quite frequently, the sketching experience is kind of like automatic sketching, mm -hmm. where you start moving your pen around, and you're feeling where the lines ought to go, but you don't know consciously why you're putting those lines there. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes you do have a kind of a, a concept of what it the, the thing looks like and you're sketching that, but oftentimes you'll be going along and say, no, that's not right. That's got to go over here like this or whatever. You don't have any, re any conscious reason why you do that, but you just have this inner experience that says, something's not quite right here, I've got to adjust the sketch in this way. So in stage three, you're trying to represent the target or some aspect of the target. Sometimes you get the whole thing. I mean, I've done some remote viewing sessions where it's just a remarkable depiction of the target, as have other viewers. Yes. Uh, Joe McMonigle is famous. He's, of course, one of the early uh, remote viewers mm -hmm. as well, who just has an aw astonishing success rate. Very detailed yes. drawings that turn out to be accurate. Yes, he's, mm -hmm. he's really good. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it may be, you know, of the, of the entire thing. Sometimes you get a sketch of just part of it. Mm -hmm. So for example, if it's the Eiffel Tower, you might draw a representation of the entire tower. But you also might just get some crisscrossing elements because that's mm -hmm. what come through to you yeah. most prominently. Mm -hmm. So then we move on to stage, stage four. four. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, this is where people often think about the, the more like being psychic, because in this stage you get what technically we call, uh, uh, what do we call? Well, abstract and uh, and abstract and concrete, complex terminology. Mm -hmm. So for example, again, I use the Eiffel Tower as an example because I don't have it in my target base. I will never have a student that gets the Eiffel Tower from me mm -hmm. so that they aren't, can't sit there and think, well, when is he going to give me the Eiffel Tower? <laughs> uh, so if the target's the Eiffel Tower, in stage one you'd identify it as a structure, and in stage two you'd say it's tall, black, metallic, uh, cold, rusty, food smells, whatever, right? Um, in stage three, you do a, a general sketch of it. In stage four, you start perceiving things like tourism, national pride, foreign, you might even get French, mm -hmm. right? Uh, monumental, park-like setting, people come here to visit. The ambiance. Uh, the ambiance, yeah, you get ambiance, and but also factual stuff as mm -hmm. well. And, uh, and But these are more detailed, more abstract uh, concepts. Um, and you can build up then now a really kind of substantive idea about what this place is. Mm -hmm. um, you still, unlike, you might name it Eiffel Tower, but generally speaking, you're unlikely to do that. 
because you're getting a descriptive concept of it. Mm -hmm. um, you get all that down, uh, and essentially that stage four is getting this more detailed yeah. kind of And the idea is to do that uh, by reporting your raw impressions as much as possible and avoiding analytical overlay. Yes. Analytical overlay being the left brain interpretation of inadequate information. Mm -hmm. um, We've all had that experience where we have bits of information about something and we jump to a conclusion about it and turn out and it turns out we're wrong. Yeah. That's a major component of mental noise is our left brain, whose job it is to interpret information that comes in, operating on it in such a way that gives you the wrong answer. Sure. <laughs> it happens yeah. all the time. Yeah. Uh, it even happens in real life. I like to use these remote viewing metaphors, right? Mm -hmm. but we have all kinds of analytical overlay in everyday life. Indeed, too. indeed yeah. we do. So I guess let's talk now about stage five. Yeah, stage five is interesting in that it actually isn't what we say it's not on signal line. You're actually n technically not being psychic in stage five. Mm -hmm. uh, without getting too complicated, the point of stage five is to actually mine data that has been dumped into your unconscious mm -hmm. or subconscious, however you want to call that, um, that's there, it's already resident there, but hasn't yet popped up in a consciousness. So you go and you can extract that that information and expand your understanding of what's what this target is about. Mm -hmm. But it's not an intellectual process. It is verges on it. It's uh -huh. it's you have to be very careful with stage five because you may start tempting the left brain to jump into this, mm -hmm. and so you have to learn this process and be very careful about it, or you're likely to start generating more noise. Yeah, and. Uh, and it's it's a we don't you don't do it in every session mm -hmm. that you do. It's a tool essentially that you can employ. If you say if you get a, a concept in stage four that you feel like there's more behind that concept. Mm -hmm. So for example, let's say you say tourism in stage four. Yeah. You get the impression of tourism. Well, you can go into stage five and what we call stage five tourism, right? The word tourism, and get things like cameras, visitors, Bermuda shorts, you know, sightseeing, you know, these kind of things mm -hmm. that all combine to to cause you to have the concept of tourism mm -hmm. at a more of a meta level, mm -hmm. and you can get down and get the micro details mm -hmm. of why you said tourism in this okay. stage. Okay. So you're accumulating more and more mm -hmm. information about the target at each stage. Mm -hmm. So when you get to what essentially is the culmination of this process. You can get into stage six, which if you've seen Close Encounters, Encounters of the Third Kind, yes. where Richard Dreyfus is making uh, Devil's Tower out of mashed potatoes on his <laughs> <Yeah>. dining room <laughs> table, right? right? That's essentially stage six, right? In stage six, you can make a three-dimensional model of the target. Now, the goal, the primary goal is to make the model. The model is another tool to help develop more information about the target. As you're engaged in this kinesthetic model making process, the hope is that will free up more information. You're to come using in. clay, is that? Well, you can use mashed potatoes if you want, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, we generally used, uh, at Fort Meade, we used uh, modeling compound, which is a form of clay. Mm -hmm. I, in my classes, I use Sculpey because it's. Uh, it's less messy than clay is, mm -hmm. but I've since come across this new material which I have to track down that seems to be a little bit more malleable mm -hmm. and less messy. You know, I'm always looking for a better product mm -hmm. to, to do this with, right? But in any case, you're, you're getting involved kinesthetically when yes. you're using your hands and you're feeling it's bringing in other parts of your own uh, body, mind, nervous mm -hmm. system. And, and the kinesthetic process is actually a sensory process of sorts. Mm -hmm. and it works two ways. It can put information into your system, but you can also bring information out. I mean, if you think about it, longhand writing is a kinesthetic process, yeah. right? It's both cognitively and kinesthetically connected. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with verbalizing. Mm -hmm. There's kinesthetics involved in actually verbalizing sure. words. Um, and in art, sketching and sculpting is a very nonverbal kinesthetic information producing mm -hmm. process. You can you can show people what you're feeling, what you're experiencing, by how you depict it through your mm -hmm. motor processes, yeah. you know, interaction of your muscles and such, in at which leaves a record behind. Well, we have a few minutes left, mm -hmm. Paul. We've described the six stages of the uh, classical controlled remote viewing training. Uh, we've talked a bit about uh, your past as a mm -hmm. member of the um, Military Intelligence Remote Viewing Program. Let me ask you in closing, what are your thoughts about the future of remote viewing? 
Well, I have two thoughts about it. Mm -hmm. One is that it's it's virtually unlimited. There's a lot of things you can do with remote viewing that we could find out about it and then we can actually do with it that we haven't even touched yet. Mm -hmm. um, the other thought is that it's going to be difficult to do that because we have a cultural mindset that makes that makes a lot of people resistant to this. Now there are obviously quite a few people who are interested in it and we reach out to those folks, but we, um, it, it, and you yourself know having been involved in parapsychology for many decades now, mm -hmm. uh, don't want to date you or anything. <laughs> you know? um, but um, support for parapsychology research in the United States has declined dramatically yeah. in recent years. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, it's, it's like mainstream science and the skeptical community have succeeded in convincing everybody that there's nothing to it, mm -hmm. and that somehow you know you you get uh, painted with this very nasty brush if you're going to engage in it, and so mm -hmm. you don't get funding. Laboratories won't touch it, um, which is very unfortunate because the evidence is probably better than it's ever been that this is a very real phenomenon, mm -hmm. and well, it's actually a group of phenomena, a very real set of phenomena. That, that from any other scientific perspective would be immediately accepted by the scientific mm -hmm. community. Yep. But because of what it is, it gets rejected a priori, right out of the box, mm -hmm. um, because mainstream science doesn't know what to do with it and feels threatened by it, frankly, I think is what is happening. Right, we're not in a psi-friendly era. That's right. I suppose, Al although at the same time, there's probably more interest in remote viewing today than there was 30 years ago. Well, yeah, 30 years ago, hardly anybody ever knew it, even knew it existed. Yeah. And now, that's almost still true if you look at percentages, but still, there are thousands and thousands of people who now know about it. Mm -hmm. so. Well, you've been a real pioneer in taking this work from uh, the bowels of a top secret military program uh, to the general public. Uh, Paul, it's been a pleasure sharing these two interviews with you, and I look forward to uh, having you come back to our studio and, and we'll have more conversations. Thank you. I'm excited about being able to do that. Thank you so much for being with me. You're welcome. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.